The question of whether life evolved or was created is by far the most important subject that we all make a decision about, whether we want to or not. If we evolved out of ordinary material over billions of years by pure chance, then there is nothing else in this universe except chemical elements and no afterlife when we die. Alternatively, if we were created by God for a purpose, then there is a life after death, and we know instinctively that this same God will judge us all in the final showdown, when the curtain finally falls on this drama of the universe. In this video I will be presenting just a few of the major evidences that there are that demonstrates that evolution could not possibly have taken place. I am well aware that many will violently reject such a conclusion, but this will not have any effect upon the facts that are presented. Having been speaking and writing against evolution since 1969, I am fully aware that people do not accept well-proven evidence if it conflicts with their present views. We all have a conceptual framework that we have built up over years of experience and anything that does not fit into that framework is rejected, not necessarily because it is wrong, but simply due to a purely emotional reaction to any thought that does not fit their present view of what life is all about. Having said that, a few do change their viewpoint when presented with facts that they had never heard before. It is in this hope that this video, which covers only a very small number of topics, will persuade some viewers to rethink their position and hopefully start on that joyous journey towards the one true and loving God who created and controls this whole universe. So let us look at some of this evidence. Before we do so, let me first deal with an evolutionist's mantra endlessly repeated by evolutionists. They claim that evolution is based on hard scientific facts, whilst creation is based on religious myths. The word science is a strong trigger word that conjures up images of men in white coats making careful, repeatable experiments that eventually benefit the world. This is true science. However, neither evolution nor creation are truly scientific because both happened once in the past and cannot be repeated. All that both theories can do is to interpret the evidence found on the earth and in the universe that will support their case. I will be showing that the evidence supporting creation is far more convincing than that supporting evolution, a theory maintained more by propaganda than hard evidence. Any scientist who dares to criticize evolution or the Big Bang Theory or relativity finds himself ridiculed, ostracized and intimidated by his peers and his career prospects badly damaged. No wonder most keep quiet. This drawing is copied accurately from a book about evolution. A drawing like this appears in all books about evolution for it gives the different strata as you go deeper and the fossilized bones of dead animals that each strata contain. Imagine going down a deep shaft into the ground then you would pass through some of these layers to the deepest and oldest rocks of the crust of the earth. At the bottom it shows the first appearance of small sea creatures without a backbone in a strata named the Cambrian. Then millions of years later fish appear in the layers, then amphibia that can live on land and sea like walruses, then reptiles, then birds and mammals, and finally man at the top in recent times. Now this all seems to confirm the progress of evolution over millions of years. But 
there are some serious flaws that evolutionists do not tell you about. Firstly, the layers just before the Cambrian do not hold any form of life at all. Small marks are called cells, but there is no evidence that they are any form of life. When we get to the Cambrian, there is a sudden explosion of life, with hundreds of different forms of life in huge numbers. To give you some idea of their complexity, here are pictures of an ammonite and a trilobite. The trilobite has flippers and a complex eye just like that of a fly. These all appear suddenly with not a single half-formed stage in the layers below. Evolutionists rarely mention this. This evidence surely shows that they were perfectly formed by our God in a very short period of time and then they all met a sudden death. This drawing is accurate because it shows dotted lines between all the major groups. With evolution, new species must not suddenly appear, they must evolve from some other species. These gaps in the drawing are saying, we believe that this group came from this earlier group, but we have no evidence of fossil links between them. Evolutionists insist that they do have connecting fossils, but two senior experts have admitted that they do not exist. Regarding the so-called missing links between apes and men, these are mainly ape bones that are claimed to have human features, but are clearly just apes. The whole subject of ape-men fossils is riddled with deception and fraudulent claims in order to convince the public that they are only clever apes, when really they are God's very special creation made in his likeness. To give you some idea just how false and misleading these artistic reconstructions are, if we look at the left-hand side of this page, the top left-hand corner gives the original bones that were found, followed by five completely different reconstructions. The most interesting are the middle two, which were both, surprisingly, by the same artist drawn for two different people. Totally different pictures, even by the same artist. Evolutionists claim that they have connections between these groups, but the one they use most often appears on this drawing. It is the fossil link between reptiles and birds known as Archaeopteryx. This has some dinosaur features such as teeth in the beak, a long bony tail with feathers, and a hook along the edge of its wings, which are features not unlike those of a dinosaur. But its wings are composed of perfectly formed flight feathers found in birds today. Evolutionists claim that feathers developed from the scales of reptiles, but they have never found anything between the two. What they don't tell you is that scales come from a completely different part of the skin to feathers, so a gradual transformation is hardly likely. A feather is extremely complicated. The vein consists of fine filaments that have barbs and barbules. They hook together to form an almost airtight membrane which is very light. There can be a million barbs on one feather alone. It is beautifully designed for flying. Having failed to give any convincing evidence of one group changing into another, we ask for evidence of the change of one species into another. They then quote the famous horse series. Let us enlarge the top few strata of the geological column from the Eocene upwards. This drawing shows the small hoofed animals at the bottom with four and three toes on the forelimb and hind limb. As time progresses, these toes become fewer until the modern horse is running on one strong toe known as the cannon bone. It is this that gives it its high speed. But what they do not tell you is that these are different horse-like animals with different numbers of ribs 
and lumbar vertebrae. There are actually about 20 very similar creatures that have been carefully chosen and arranged in a special order to convince the public that they evolved over millions of years. In fact, there is another deception that stares you in the face. According to evolutionists, it took 208 million years for every variety of mammal that we have on this earth to evolve. Lions, sheep, rabbits, dogs, etc. Yet this series they present says that it took about one third of that time merely to modify the hoof of the horse. There is something seriously wrong with the time scale. One of the many problems evolutionists face is the existence of whales that suck their young but live in the sea. They say that a mammal on the land must have returned to the water, but they can produce no satisfactory fossil links for this huge transformation. One series they have produced is of the animals pictured on the right, starting with Diocodexis, then Pachycetus and Ambulocetus. Again, we have just a few bones carefully arranged to look convincing. Where the evidence is missing, artists are always willing to fake their drawings. In the November 2001 issue of the National Geographic magazine, the artist replaced the small hooves of the Ambulocetus with claws and drew webs between them to convince their readers that it was on its way to becoming adapted to a water environment. A very unusual animal is the duck-billed platypus. It lays eggs but suckles its young, has webbed feet, pockets in its jaws to carry food, a soft, sensitive bill that can detect the movement of worms under the mud, waterproof fur, a beaver-like tail, and a poisonous spur on its rear legs. Our question to the evolutionist is, what were its ancestors? In fact, in producing his theory of evolution, Darwin told what he knew was a deliberate lie. All species can vary slightly in nature, but not much, as they would generate weaknesses that would result in their elimination. This range can be extended by breeders who can protect extreme but weaker varieties, but even then breeders are well aware that there are still limits that they cannot breed beyond. Darwin knew this, but still said in his Origin of Species, It is rash to assert that a limit has been attained in any one case. This opened the floodgates for any amateur biologist to fabricate evolutionary links between species and whole groups which have never existed in nature. We now come to the real weakness of the theory. The proposed evolution of life from simple chemicals in the primeval soup to modern man. In 1952, Miller took some simple gases thought to exist in the Earth's early history, pass them through a spark, condense the results out, and then analyse the contents. To the great delight of evolutionists, they found some amino acids. Now these form proteins which are about the most important building blocks in the formation of living organisms. A protein can have up to 3,000 amino acids long, and each amino acid has to be in exactly the right sequence. Otherwise, like a computer program, the organism is defective or dies. Let us see what the chances are of a very small proteinoid of only 100 amino acids long of a specific sequence of amino acids being formed by chance in the primeval soup. There are 40 amino acids to choose from but life is only made from the left-handed form, i.e. let's say there are just 20 to choose from. The possibility of the first amino acid being correct is 1 in 20. The possibility of the second one being correct is 1 in 20 times 20. For the third amino acid being the right one, it is one chance in 
20 times 20 times 20. For all 100 places, the chance of all being correctly filled is 1 to 20 multiplied 100 times. This is a figure of 1 with 130 noughts behind it. To give you some idea how huge this figure is, the number of atoms in the whole universe is about 1 with only 78 noughts behind it. With such huge odds against it, life could not possibly have arisen by pure chance. Evolutionists sometimes refer to a simple cell and may draw a wiggly shape with a black blob for a nucleus. This drawing shows just how very complicated every cell is. To give some idea of how complex life is, in the cell are many mitochondria that provide the energy for the cell's use. On the surface of the mitochondria are small motors that have a bent axle on the outside that squeeze two chemicals together to form ATP that now contains energy. They give up this energy elsewhere in the cell and then return to be squeezed together again to provide more energy. If we worked hard for 24 hours, we would recycle one ton of ATP. There is yet another rotating motor in the flagellum of bacteria. This rotates a corkscrew shaped flagella that pushes the water in one direction, sending the bacteria in the opposite direction. If the bacteria wants to change course, it merely turns the blue universal joint, the corkscrew points in another direction, and the bacteria changes course. If we accidentally cut ourselves, a hard clot quickly forms and the flow of blood is stopped. Now this requires some chemicals to act together to form the clot, but they don't actually exist because they require other chemicals to make them, and so on down the line. The whole chain of events is shown in this diagram, and about 32 chemicals are involved in the whole process. It requires only one of these chemicals in your body to malfunction and you will be a haemophiliac and could die from loss of blood with the slightest cut because the clot will not form. This is a chart of some of the compounds involved in the metabolism of the human body and is one of the most impressive charts I have seen. You can see here how every chemical has an effect upon many other chemicals and this enlargement shows it in greater detail. I have another chart that is identical to this but if there is a malfunction of just one chemical they can tell you which of the serious genetic illnesses you will suffer from. I challenge any evolutionist to say how such a complex and interconnected organization could possibly result in many small accidental additions over millions of years. It had to be right first time and proves that life was created perfectly the first time by an infinite and wise God. Several years ago I came across one of the most amazing examples of how the cell operates. In the cell a chemical may be made in one part of the cell but used in another part of the cell. How do these chemicals travel to their required destination? In the cell is a network of microtubules. There are a bundle of chemicals known as kinesin motors and this animation is a graphic drawing of what they do. They pick up the chemical, put it on their heads and then walk with two feet along the surface of the microtubules and then drop the chemical off at the correct destination. Remember that these kinesin motors are in the cells of the very first animals found in the Cambrian rock strata. There was no time for them to be gradually evolved. We have all heard of DNA and its huge complexity.
The coding uses only two pairs of chemicals that are repeated along the DNA. If there is an error in the chain due to ultraviolet light damage, then this damaged section will affect all future replications of the DNA and these errors can build up from one generation to another. However, to prevent this, there are four checking chemicals that work together. Two of them work along the DNA checking every link. When it finds an error, it stops and the first pair move away and the third chemical straddles the chain. This snips the links well away from the bad section and then leaves. The fourth chemical then strips off the faulty section and they all move away. The gap is then filled by the correct pairing nucleotide partner automatically joining on to the good half of the chain and the DNA is now correct once again. Remember that these are all fairly simple chemicals but how could they have evolved slowly to give such a complex repair system over millions of years? In this talk you've been faced with good scientific verifiable facts. Facts that you will never hear on the TV or anywhere in the mass media. Indeed, creationists are consistently blocked from being allowed to present their evidence on the public platform because this is all rigidly controlled by evolutionists. Indeed, I have been on radio several times and each time I issue a challenge to evolutionists to debate the subject with me. I have never received a response. Some may say that evolution took place but it was used by God to bring about the present world we live in. They are known as theistic evolutionists. But the evidence that I have presented cuts that possibility at the very root at X on the diagram. For I contend that evolution could not possibly have taken place. And I have only given just a few examples of why this is so. So you are now faced with a choice. You were either created or you evolved. If you still believe that you evolved, then no matter what good facts are presented, you have to reject them because you must believe evolution, as this is the only theory that allows you to get rid of God. Everybody knows instinctively that if there is a creation, then there must be a creator. The possibility of the existence of a great creator God is totally unacceptable to most people not on scientific grounds but simply because they do not want to believe that there exists a God who created them for a purpose and before whom they will finally have to stand and give an account of their lives. What they do not realize is that those who reject the love that God has for them cannot then complain if he finally rejects them. By their own free decision, they have already condemned themselves. In summary, evolution is not supported by the scientific facts, says there is no afterlife, which means firstly that wicked people are never punished for their sins, and there are no rewards for a good life, and secondly, makes all human motivations and experiences ultimately meaningless. Love, self-sacrifice, martyrdom, kindness, altruism and joy, etc. None of these will exist when all life eventually ceases after the heat death of the sun. It is a philosophy of ultimate despair, darkness, depression and makes a mockery of all human endeavour. On the other hand, the true Christian faith is rational, supported by scientific evidence and gives a complete picture of life and eternity that is realistic and accommodates all the events in this earthly life and the hereafter. 
gives true Christians who have come to God on God's terms, i.e. through Christ's death, the certain assurance that they will spend eternity in the presence of this loving God. God will judge all humans with perfect justice, rewarding those who truly love him and who have also loved others, and condemning rebellion against him. It gives a deep sense of joy and peace with God and man, looks to death with little fear, and it gives strength and wisdom to deal with all life's problems that come upon him in a mature Christian attitude. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created time as we know it today. However, he can see the whole of history, past, present and future, and this strongly suggests that time for Christians in heaven will be completely different to the time we experience in this life. This could put a different interpretation upon how we will actually experience time in eternity. He created. Only God can create material things out of nothing. He spoke and it was done. Verse 3 And God said, Let there be light. Even today the exact nature of light is not known. Verse 5 and the morning and the evening was the first day. The Hebrew for day is Yom, and some try to interpret this as a long period of time, i.e. in the day of. However, this letter from Professor James Barr, who is not a creationist, admits that all Hebrew scholars accept that in this context, the word definitely signifies a normal period of 24 hours. Verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass, herbs and trees. Sudden creation of very complex forms of life as found in the earliest fossils of animals and plants in the geological column. It was this fact that convinced me, as a liberal Christian who did not believe the Bible was fully reliable at that time, that Genesis at least was accurate. For some two years I lectured upon the accuracy of Genesis, but I did not accept the rest of the Bible was true. Verse 11 Animals and plants were to breed after their kind. These have been classified into major groups and subgroups, but despite the insistent reassurances of evolutionists, no evidence has ever been found of one major group changing into another major group. Small variations are called microevolution, but this cannot lead to major changes known as macroevolution. Verse 6 Let there be an expanse to separate the water from the water. For many years, creationists accepted that there was a protective water vapour canopy around the earth, but most have abandoned the idea. Despite this, I consider that there was a water vapour canopy around the earth. What persuades me is that water vapour is clear, and yet has a window in its absorption spectrum which is exactly matched by the very wavelength emitted by the radiation from a warmed earth. So the heat from the earth could escape, and the earth would not have overheated. In addition, it blocked dangerous cosmic rays from reaching the earth. I refer to this later. Verse 14. He made the sun and the moon. Interestingly, three days after the earth. There are many unexplained features about the planetary system. First of all, all orbits are mainly circular. If our Earth were closer to the Sun by 5%, the oceans would boil. 
If it was further away than 1%, the oceans would freeze. Secondly, the planets have widely different compositions. Of the moons, Venus is spinning slowly backwards. Uranus is spinning on its side. Of 44 major moons, 12 are going round the wrong way, i.e. retrograde. And it is almost impossible for a planet to capture a moon. It would swing off into an elliptical orbit into space. And no satisfactory explanation of how our planetary system could have evolved has ever been given. Evolution must have many millions of years for it to develop by pure chance. There are many scientific results that show the age of the Earth to be from a few thousand years to about one million years old. But this was still not enough time for evolution. Then they discovered that many rocks had small nodules of radioactive material in them. By measuring the amount of radioactive material left and the amount of daughter element present that it throws off as it decays, they could estimate the time it had taken to decay. Assuming the rate of decay was constant for all time, they got results of hundreds of millions of years to the delight of the evolutionists. How can creationists still claim that the Earth is only about 6,000 years old? The answer is simple, for they have deliberately ignored an important factor. This chart shows that the speed of light was very, very much fast in the past, and the decay rate of radioactive material is proportional to it. So when the speed of light was very fast, radioactive decay was that much faster, and the rock would very quickly look very old with a large amount of daughter element it would have quickly thrown off. Satterfield estimated from astronomical observation that its maximum speed was between 10 to the power of 7 and 10 to the power of 11. A Russian astronomer independently said that it would have been about 10 to the power of 10 faster which is within Setterfield's range. So we have the evolutionists billions of years to which we can apply a very large correction factor, which reduces the age to a few thousand years only, in accordance with the 6,000 years time scale of the Bible records. The effect of a high speed of light on the transport constants would be viscosity would decrease diffusion would increase and osmosis would increase. When C was high, its effect would not be proportional to C, but would still be considerable. Let us look at how these changes would affect life when it was first created 6,000 years ago. The Bible records that the patriarchs lived for almost 1,000 years, and this is ridiculed today. However, with low viscosity, the heart would be under much less strain and with faster diffusion, digestion would be easier. And similarly, many other processes in the body would have been easier. So with healthy food, no damaging cosmic rays and other benefits, man could easily live for a very long time. Pteranodons are huge, ungainly flying reptiles found in the fossil record that scientists said would only be able to glide and would have had difficulty in flying. With high C, the lower viscosity would have reduced drag, enabling them to fly with ease. Insects breathe through small tubes in their bodies that allow oxygen in and waste gases out. With low viscosity and high diffusion, these small tubes would have allowed easy flow of the gases, enabling large insects to breathe, which they could not do today. Huge insects have been found in the fossil record. One foot long cockroaches and 30 inch wingspan dragonflies. With high C, electron movement and nerve impulses would have been faster. 
This means mental thinking would have been faster and Adam would have been very intelligent. So when he chose to disobey God, he knew exactly what he was doing. At the beginning of the flood, the water vapour canopy collapsed, bringing torrential rain. Most of the water in the oceans, however, came from the fountains of the deep that brought up dissolved rock materials in the hot water. As it rose through cooler layers, it precipitated out the various clays, pebbles and rocks that formed the Earth's rock strata. It is the only mechanism that can explain the presence of the vast areas of the very fine clays. They were produced by chemical precipitation out of the rising hot solutions from the depths as it cooled. Note again the sudden appearance of perfect animals in the Cambrian period. The Ark was a huge structure, well able to house two of each kind. Dinosaurs would only need to be juveniles. Feeding them all could have been solved by inducing a state of hibernation in all the animals. As a result of the collapse of the water vapour canopy, the lifespan of the patriarchs decreased, as genetic damage from cosmic rays built up over the succeeding generations. This is why now we must not marry a near relative, because our offspring would get a double dose of the same damaged genes. If a small amount of radioactive material is placed in a cage of rats, their lifespan decreases in just the same way. A further cause for the decrease in the lifespan of the patriarchs is that dangerous cosmic rays are deflected away from the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. But this is decreasing every year and it is due to the circulating currents in the Earth and therefore cannot be renewed. It will eventually be zero. We are also protected by the ozone layer, but this also is said to be decreasing. Dinosaurs all lived at the same time as man. However, most were swept to their death during the flood. Those that survived in the ark emerged to face quite different climate conditions. Dinosaurs often have quite small lungs, which would have been adequate with the extra pressure of the water vapour canopy but its collapse would have made life more difficult for them. As you go back in time, there are an increasing number of accounts of huge animals roaming the whole earth and threatening the human population. Beowulf saga is just one record. Grindelwald means dragon's wood. In the book of Job, the author describes the great creatures Behemoth in Job 40 and Leviathan in Job 41, which were alive in his day. So there is good evidence of their existence in recent records, although most land dinosaurs seem to have died out. However, conditions in the sea were more stable and sightings and carcasses of strange sea creatures are frequent in comparatively recent times. In 1977, a strange creature was dredged up from the ocean bed by a Japanese fishing vessel, and the trained biologist on board took some photos and made a drawing, but it had to be thrown back to prevent contamination of the catch. The initial reactions of Japanese experts that this was not any known creature, but looked like a plesiosaur. The evolutionists could not tolerate this, and a deputation from France promoted a major report claiming that it was only the carcass of a basking shark. But this could not be for the following reasons. It had a long neck and huge flippers. There was no smell of ammonia when f as when fish decay. This carcass was dredged up, but basking shark carcasses float onto beaches. And there was red meat visible and it had horny fronds on its flippers. 
The carcass of a basking shark is completely different to that shown in the biologist's drawing. His witness and findings were never presented in the report because they were obviously too contradictory for the conclusions that they had determined beforehand. In this way, the theory of evolution is preserved by twisting and hiding the facts. But why should they wish to dismiss this carcass? Dinosaurs were said to have died out 65 million years ago. To admit that they were still living would have destroyed the carefully fabricated propaganda that the Earth is millions of years old. Their existence today would support the idea that the Earth is only about 6,000 years old, as young Earth creationists have long contended. After the flood, the people started to build a temple to their gods, so God confused their languages and dispersed them over the whole earth, to locations he had destined them to occupy. A.C. Custance contended that the Shemites, that's the Arabs and Jews, represented the spiritual part of man, and they stayed mainly in the Middle East. The Japhethites were the thinking part of man, and they split into two separate groups, the Euro-Japhethites and the Indo-Japhethites. The Hamites were the practical aspects of man. They went all over the world and could survive under a wide range of conditions. All the present na major nationalities are referred to in Genesis 11, the Table of Nations. Many ask, where did all the different nations come from? As the small tribes of people migrated to various parts of the world, they would inbreed and gradually very specific features would emerge. The dark skin of the African, the yellow skin of the Chinese, the white skin of the European. Thus, the genetic makeup of the human race was fairly variable, but we were all still one race. It is just like the breeding of dogs. They have a very flexible genome and a wide range of dogs have been bred from the same basic mongrel form. But they are still dogs, even though they look like different species. As the nations dispersed around the world, they took with them the story of the flood. Several hundred of these stories have been collected by anthropologists, but they rarely mention this fact. Byron C. Nelson compared them in this chart, and you can see that even on the opposite side of the earth they still had the story, including the use of a bird. All this indicates that the flood actually took place. Even Chinese pictograms refer back to the flood. For a boat, they have the pictogram of a vessel plus eight plus mouths, and there were eight people in the ark. To hand down or continue is represented by water plus eight plus persons. Eight people handed down their skills, traditions and experience after the flood. To covet was two trees and a woman, and Eve coveted the forbidden fruit. The very first is represented by life plus dust plus man. Adam was made from the dust of the earth and given the first life of man. Beginning is two plus persons. Human life began with two people. Regarding the flood account, let us look at another example of how facts are hidden from the public. This diagram charts the biblical history of the Israelites, with the flood taking place about 2345 BC. Critics of the Bible claim that the Gilgamesh epic, which was full of stories of pagan gods and myths, was written about 1800 BC. They also claim that the whole of the Old Testament was forged by Ezra and Nehemiah 
much later, between 950 and 500 BC, and that they copied the Gilgamesh epic, but referring to only one god. However, in 1910, a paper was published of a tablet found at Nippur describing the flood in exactly the same monotheistic terms and details as the Genesis account. The main point is that it was dated as early as 2200 BC, 400 years before the very weird pagan account of the flood given in the Gilgamesh epic. So this very early Nippur tablet and the Genesis account agree with each other, and it is the Gilgamesh epic that is the corrupted version, which Christians have been claiming for many years. Now here is a discovery that destroyed the critics' consistent claims that the Genesis account is only a copy of the Gilgamesh epic. But what happened to it? The paper was totally ignored and effectively hushed up because it showed that the Bible gave the accurate account. Now, 100 years after its publication, it was brought to the attention of the Christian world in 2011 by Dr. Cooper of the Creation Science Movement in their pamphlet number 382. Returning to the time of the Hebrews in Egypt, they settled under Joseph in the land of Goshen, around the city of Avaris. Interestingly, there is still a canal called Bar Yusuf, Joseph's Canal, probably constructed under his orders for the easy distribution of food. Furthermore, David Roll found a huge palace at Avaris that had an 11-metre pyramid in the garden. This housed a burial chamber, now empty, and a large statue that had been demolished, but the head was nearby. This is a picture of the head, which had some fascinating features. Firstly, over the right shoulder is a throwing stick, as a sign of high office used for someone who is a foreigner. Secondly, the face had been badly mutilated, the eyes gouged out and the head had received a huge blow. Thirdly, the statue was wearing a coat of red and black, which was similar to those of the Midianite tribes. Putting all this together, Roll claims this was a statue of Joseph erected in his garden when he died. Joseph would have had just such a grand palace in the midst of his people at Avaris. The throwing stick was used as a sign of high office held by a foreigner. The coat would have been not unlike Joseph's coat of many colours, made by his father, perhaps on a common Midianite chevron pattern. The desecration of the face is understandable. The Israelites had brought the Egyptian nation to destitution, their army was destroyed, they had taken their gold and jewels, the land was ruined, and they had all lost their firstborn child. It is little wonder that they wreaked their vengeance on what the Hebrews had left behind, Joseph's mausoleum, and particularly his statue. With all this supportive evidence, I would agree with Roll that this is probably the head of Joseph's statue. Roll gives a picture of what he thought Joseph's statue might have looked like. When the Israelites left Egypt, they met the cruel Amalekites coming towards Egypt. They fought and the Israelites won. The Amalekites then walked into Egypt and became known as the Hyksos, meeting no resistance because the Egyptian army had been destroyed and the nation was destitute. Many years later, God sent Saul to wipe out the Amalekites, as we read in 1 Samuel 15. Jericho, like many large cities, would have thick walls surrounded by a steep slope covered with a hard plaster known as a glissade, at the bottom of which would be a deep ditch. All this would have made any approach difficult. Garstang excavated the hill mound of the ancient city of Jericho 
and found the city burnt and the walls had fallen outwards, just as we read in the Bible. The fallen masonry covered the glissade and filled up the ditch. This allowed the encircling army to go, every man straight before him, as recorded in Joshua chapter 6 verse 20. So disturbing was this evidence supporting the Bible that Kathleen Kenyon was dispatched to destroy the story, which she did with false evidence. She was made a dame for her work. In Joshua chapter 10, we have the account of the sun being commanded to stand still, which it did for 24 hours. Gerardus Bow collected many folk stories from around the world and plotted them on a map. By drawing the night shadow on it and moving it, he found he could position all the long night stories in the shadow and the long day stories in the daylight section. In Fiji, the sun was just setting on the horizon and stayed there. This enabled Bao to pinpoint the time as between May the 8th to the 15th in 1448 BC, starting at about 9 a.m. Who founded Britain? Brutus was the son of an Italian king banished from Italy. He led a successful rebellion of Greek slaves from the Trojan War and following the red route on the map, sailed with them to Egypt and then on to Britain, arriving at Totnes about 1104 BC. The stone he is reputed to have stood on to claim the land is still in Totnes High Street. The interesting thing is that the Druid priests who came with him memorized their laws, but when they wrote anything down it was always in Greek. Similarly, they had very Greek-like coinage, and when Caesar invaded England, he noticed that they fought battles on chariots, just like his Greek opponents. So there is considerable support for Brutus being the founder of this nation. There is another surprising fact. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 21, Paul sends him greetings from Pudens, Linus and Claudia. Linus and Claudia were the son and daughter of Caractacus, a very brave British warrior, and Pudens was Claudia's husband. Caractacus was betrayed and taken to Rome, where, amazingly, he was pardoned by the emperor, and the whole family settled in Rome and became Christians. His father, Bran, is said to have returned to Britain and converted the nation from the royalty downwards as early as 58 AD. That Britain was the very first nation to accept Christianity as the national faith has long been accepted even by the Roman Catholic Church. God seems to have had a special purpose for this tiny nation in the spreading of his gospel. In this video I have presented just a few items that show that the evidence supports the historical events recorded in the Bible. The true Bible believer does not need such confirmation, for the Bible has spoken directly to his heart. It is hoped, however, that they will still find this information very encouraging and realize yet again that despite attacks on the Bible by those enemies of God with their warped and deceitful evolutionary science, that true science will always agree with the Bible.